there's one man that stood out as far as I'm concerned. In fact, the man that was the star of the Academy Award presentation. A man who's done more for the sweater industry than anybody else. And also, I think, one of the only working philosophers today and one of America's truly great humorists. And I am very honored to say my good friend. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mort Saul. people here than conquered Panama this week. Right? <laughs> so 82 people did it to keep costs down. Anyway, uh, you're going to need more trouble on this mic. I hate to be a diehard, but uh, I came from the audio fair at the Biltmore Hotel. So uh, now this school, uh, this is really, uh, this is an outgrowth of City College, right? In a manner of speaking. So... <laughs> I read, it's all right, I was just joking. So I just, just want to know if you had school spirit, that's all. Now, uh, it, there are different ways of showing it. Uh, I did a concert with Brubeck at the University of Georgia, and they had a way of showing school spirit, uh, having to do with mob violence, and <laughs> burning a cross in front of the gym. Anyway, so, don't you have any more trouble in this? I mean, it's really not me, huh? All right, I just have a cold, okay. So, uh, what I, want, I wanted to mention before I go any farther, is that uh, I have to give you a couple of news bulletins and I want to say a couple of words about City College <laughs> because I drove by there on the way up here and a campus life seems to be lacking a little and uh, like the streetcar doesn't stop there just sort of there <laughs> nothing I know but they have a coffee house so things are looking up right <laughs> so anyway uh, what had happened I have to start this I mean, Mrs. Luce didn't get the job I just want to mention that. So, Thank you. Well, I, we won Brazil back. So, <laughs> so uh, Mrs. Luce, I have to mention this because uh, after the Academy show, I got into a lot of trouble with her indirectly and with Hedda Hopper because on the Academy show, for those of you that saw it, I, uh, or who saw it, I saw, uh, I mean, I remember I said uh, a couple of things about General MacArthur. I had that joke there. And a lot of people thought it was kind of out of context and so forth. Uh, the reason I did it is because Truman was in the audience. And I gave my tickets to Truman. I had two tickets. And the girl I was taking is making a television series and wasn't ready. She was shooting and she couldn't come. So we gave the tickets to Truman. He didn't have tickets to the Academy Award show. And uh, he had been uh, wrapped in Hedda Hopper's column earlier that week in which she said that he had spoken at UCLA uh, against the Un-American Activities Committee. And uh, she pointed that out about him. And she didn't tell everything in his background, you know. And the fact that he had uh, worked in Washington before he started working at communist rallies. <laughs> so, well, listen. So, thank you. So, uh, about the sound system. All right. So, anyway, she, uh, they never failed. Soon they'll have a guy out in a white coat to fix it, right? <laughs> School shows. Anyway. So, <laughs> no, no. can't cut the cord with the university, all right? One light out is a form of censorship. Thank you. Oh, uh, will you? All right. Now, so uh, Mrs. Luce, uh, anyway, Hedda Hopper got very bugged at the re remark about MacArthur, and she said uh, that, uh, well, she called me a communist. That was the way it started. And then, that's, a, all right, that's the easiest way. Thank you. So, <laughs> can't escape your background, huh? all right. So, actually, uh, I never answer those kind of charges because it would scare everybody to death if they knew how far out I was. I'm so much further than that that it's... <laughs> anyway, so, it's, I have a new group I'm defending anyway. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Anyway, so, well, uh, so then she called me, and then Henry Luce, Mrs. Luce's husband, of course, uh, called me a kind of a rabble rouser, a sort of an atheist and everything, in an editorial in Life magazine this week. And uh, he refers to me, not by name, but you can pretty well tell who he means. And uh, he wrote it himself, Mr. Luce, although he has his staff here, it's his well-paid. And uh, 
this is, he, he refers to me, he says he, and he goes on, and it's very definite it's me. Whenever you see he in lower case, it's me. See? Right? So, <laughs> literally. Well, this really gets better. So the, uh, the, the Academy Award show changed everything, but uh, this is kind of off the top. It's not material, but it really happened. Uh, first of all, Billy Graham, who was in Melbourne, Australia, saving the city of Melbourne. So he does, she doesn't take people on. He takes on entire cities. And uh, I don't doubt, you know, I never doubted his veracity, but if he really wanted a challenge, why doesn't he go to Vegas? Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Onward. So I'll tell you about that in a minute, too. That's another anyway, so uh, the, the new group I'm defending, which I'm going to get to later in detail, is not, I'm not, I just stopped defending the faith on integration. I, well, I mean, I, I work on that kind of part-time, but I stopped on that. I'm not worried about ethnic groups or minorities, and I'm not worried about labor's problems anymore, uh, but I'm worried about women as a minority, and uh, I really am, uh, because I think uh, there's a whole group making war on them, and uh, they're an unorganized minority. That's why they can't defend themselves. And uh, I think they should pay their dues and all, but they do uh, the way they shouldn't. I saw a movie last night called Some Like It Hot, which I think is anti-feminine. And it's anti-feminine in a way that is not exactly masculine. It's sort of... Anyway, I'm... <laughs> This is very tough for me to get into, but I, ha I just want to see, see it, it starts with women, well, it starts with men uh, who kind of attack women as a group, you know, they like have no, you know, they say that they are inept and they can't reason, they can't drive, which is just as important as reasoning, as we all know, and, uh, right? And then women are, are all attacking themselves. All the girls I work with in television who are all directors. On the Academy show, we had a female director who was sort of like a Trotskyite girl, you know? <laughs> You know, stand over there, you know, that kind of girl, strong. So, or they say, they always say things like, uh, I can do a job as well as any man, which is a high standard, as we all know, right? <laughs> so that's two groups attacking him, and a third group attacking him. Uh, there's a kind of a middle group who attack women, who are uh, sort of, uh, they sort of rejects from the hairdressing academy in Beverly Hills, you know. They all sell antiques, fellas like that. And, uh, and women insulate their position in society by defending them. They keep saying, well, uh, he's really mixed up because he went to a military school and he had a strong mother, and, uh, right? and uh, sociologically he can be explained. That's what they all say. And, and he's thin and involuted and withdrawn and talented and sensitive, right? And safe. Well, no, but... Right? No? I know it. I worry about that a lot. Anyway, so I'll get back to that. So anyway, the Academy Awards show, that's, uh, I'll talk about this in a minute, but it's... Uh, I got into a lot of trouble with Hedda Hopper, uh, as I say, who called me a communist, and also uh, Billy Graham, who called me an atheist. This had to do with, well, there's a whole thing that went on. The crescendo, where I'm working now, some of the time, uh, did not close over the holidays, the high holidays. And, uh, I, well, <laughs> I know they were open, but did they serve bread? Well, I don't know. <laughs> so... <laughs> So uh, I'm in there, and uh, everybody's saying, they got pickets up and down, you know, saying that, you know, you're unfair to this temple because you're open. So, <laughs> and, and oh, and I forgot, and a reformed temple. I got to mention this, right? So, you know, I felt like going out the sidewalk and saying, you know, get into the religion or get out of it, you know, but that's not the, changing it. So then they said to me, do you have any faith? And I said, yes. And they said, well, Billy Graham said you're an atheist. That's the way it built. So uh, it's kind of a smear campaign. So it's not, I must explain to you that it's not that I'm an atheist. It's just that I am of a different faith than Billy Graham. That's what it is, right? <laughs> and almost everyone is, I find. Uh, yeah. So, oh yeah? So... <laughs> They make shadows, right? He's a horse. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> stereo. All right. So, uh, anyway, uh, so this, uh, this whole faith thing, anyway, I'm, I'm supposed to be a Zen Buddhist. That's the press release. I think they mentioned it. And, right? And services are held at the Unicorn and Cosmo Alley. <laughs> Everybody's out of... Uh, the nearest coffee house from here is the Oedipus Rex, right? At SC. You have to have a coffee house. It's not really campus life. Anyway. I'll talk about school later and other problems, but uh, it's a good thing it's only four years because you really do crack, don't you? Toward the end, you really couldn't make it anymore. 
but the uh, sleep teaching. That's usually what it comes down to. Anyhow, I'll back to this in a minute. So, first of all, I have to explain that as you uh, develop this school and you evolve, you're going to get your own traditions eventually. And, uh, you know, eventually you'll have your med school and a clinic and people filling it with mononucleosis, right? And, <laughs> and the student's disease. And uh, I had mono again last month, for, again, for the 13th time. And uh, I got it, uh, you know, I've had it all ways. I usually get it from fatigue. And if you, uh, if you get it from fatigue, usually uh, st studying sometimes, or usually the extracurricular life in school, uh, you get it. And uh, you don't get any sleep and everything. So you, you get mono. Uh, although it was always up at Cal, where I was for a long time, it was always called a kissing disease. That's what everybody would call it. And uh, I never got it that way in my life, I have to admit. It makes a better story if you get it that way. Uh, one time in the Army, there was a guy who I admired a lot. Uh, it's kind of a rough guy. He's an officer and everything, a fly flyer. And he said he got, uh, he got sick once, actually, by shaking hands with someone, but it didn't make a good story. So he built a whole thing around it before he turned himself in for treatment. That's what I'm coming to. <laughs> So, you have to build a story. It has to do with masculine ego, which is a redundancy, but what can we do, right? So, <laughs> well, so now, uh, to get back to this premise, what is our premise? Oh, yes. So, early, I want to, I'm just kind of a confessional until I get to the material. But, uh, so when you get, uh, when I had mono, you know, I've had it several times. And when I, I, the last time I got it, I was in Vegas, which was a drag. I went to the Flamingo Hotel last a month, and I worked there with Giselle McKenzie, whom you may have seen on television, and she has a kind of a wholesome act, sort of a YMCA act, and she has, <laughs> see it? She has those kids with her, you know, it's four kids, and they're sort of, they call them the curfew kids, and they all dance and everything, and uh, they're supposed to be 11, you know, and there's a rumor that they're all between 35 and 40, and, two, <laughs> and someone's feeding them liquor, so, like dogs, so anyway. She, uh, I was working with her and trying to prove that, I uh, see that I'm literary enough, but not too literary to be commercial. So everything was going great in the hotel, and I got mononucleosis. And uh, the doctors up there are not the greatest. It's a, another good argument uh, for health insurance, which is coming. And as you know, Canada goes to socialized medicine this week, and England has had it for 10 years now. And uh, there's certain groups in this country that are somewhat opposed to it. And uh, as you know, and uh, I, well, it depends where you're sitting. I, it would be kind of a drag if it came in like when you were a senior in med school. It'd be great. <laughs> That's right. Would, uh, would upset your entire life. You'd have to get your program changed, right? Hey, three dollars. <laughs> you can find your counselor in, right? It's not in. So they're never in. So anyway. Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, I went to see this doctor in Vegas who gave me cortisone without an examination. But you might like to know about this. Uh, the American Medical Association responsible group. And he gave me cortisone, which doesn't help too much, you know. And he said to me, uh, you have to take enough until you find yourself acting in unbalanced fashion and you, you cut back. That's the only way they know. And they experiment on you. So, like, uh, you remember that whole hormone thing a few years ago when everybody was taking testosterone? And they used to, uh, you know, and uh, if you find yourself crawling on a weather vane, you know that you've taken, right? It's, a, it's insane. So, wild. So, uh, then, so I started taking, uh, he gave me Dexamils for the feeling of well-being. And I had this feeling of well-being. Everything's great, you know. And Fino is in Dexamils. So you're kind of up, but you're not too up. And uh, a lot of you remember this when you were in school, you took a lot of these. You're not supposed to, you know, but you guys used to get them from people in the College of Pharmacy and so forth at Cal. And everybody was always taking pills uh, so that they could go in and kind of shove the curve up, you know. And uh, you know, everybody was just going like mad. Some people, some people couldn't even move, you know, they just sort of freeze. I, it's good. But campus life was hectic and all. So uh, anyway, the, uh, I never took them, you know, except for certain, you know, major problems, like in the morning, getting to class and so forth, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then, nobody used to, you know, do they take roll here? I bet they take roll. Nobody takes roll at the University of California. Nobody goes. It's considered very non-you to go to class. It's frowned upon. And uh, everybody buys notes. That's the whole thing. So the classes are generally full of people who work for this organization that sells the notes. <laughs> and they, I know. And, uh, <laughs> that's right. And they, uh, and they buy the notes, see, and, then you, and uh, during finals, a lot of people will go just as a point of honor, they'll go, right? And then, you know, you just stop a cop and ask them where the campus is, where you can report. <laughs> Boy, 
wild. Anyway, so I'm in Las Vegas, which is doubly depressing, and I'm taking uh, these pills. And uh, I'm taking Dexamils, only nothing happened. So I went back to the doctor, and he put me on Dexedrine. This is by prescription, so it's all right, of course. I'm having, con you know, constriction and so forth of the heart. And then after that, he put me on Benzedrine. That was the end. And uh, I did that for like three days, and I fell on my head. And uh, before that, I made friends with everybody. You wouldn't have recognized me. So no hostility. I felt great, you know. And uh, girls, girls were yelling and crying and everything over conflicts, and I just laughed, you know, kind of a good guy. And, uh, you know, and tolerant. Hitler had a lot of problems. You know, that kind of, right? That open view of life. And I'm taking these pills. So uh, Benzedrine is the end, and you better, you want to cool that because it gives you a, uh, Dexamils are nothing, you know, you can't really tell with anybody, you're kind of jittery, but Benzedrine is wild because you have that kind of large view of life, you know, really at the end, especially if you take it in the morning, right when you get up, have that large view of life, but you have a lot of trouble with minor uh, decisions, sort of, you know, like, <laughs> so like, I know the destiny of man, you know, but which is the left sock? <laughs> No. So, <laughs> all true tonight. Now, uh, so then, and, and Vegas is a drag anyway, and it's a uh, everybody. You know, really nothing happens up there. Everybody keeps escaping, but it's usually neurotics who go up there. SC is full of that kind of person. The kind of people have golf clubs with them in their room and tennis rackets being stretched eternally and uh, they're always going I was leaving to take a break because of how tough work is at school and they're always going to Vegas and uh, all the girls I know I always thought that the moral standard was low there because everybody said I'd see girls you know we're kind of dull down here but uh, you know just kind of level girls but then I'd see two or three of them go to Vegas in the weekend and they'd say well we're going to Vegas and I think to myself well it has a connotation you know of hilarity and all and probably when they're up there they're the end they're, the, they're not the end here but they're the end up there so then I got up there, and they're not the end up there either, you know. They're just, they're sort of those girls, only up there. And really, so, and uh, they have a great color line in Las Vegas. It's kind of sort of derivative bigotry. They didn't evolve it. They borrowed it from the South. And uh, they don't have time to develop traditions yet of that. And uh, there's nothing to do there except get married and gamble. That's what everybody does, or get divorced and gamble. And... Uh, well, get to getting married and gambling, or maybe uh, that's good. There's kind of a redundancy there. I haven't thought of it that way. Before. So, they, uh, so then, while I was up there, a comedian whom you know, who makes records for the same company I do, got married and had it annulled like in eight hours. And uh, I don't use his name, not because I'm being coy or anything, but because it'll probably ruin his life. The publicity was the lowest here in the papers. He married a chorus girl, 19, because he was going out of his mind up there. There's nothing to do. It's like being on an island. She married a girl 19. You know, she's different than the others. And, uh, you know, and uh, she's, uh, she reads and everything, you know. And, and so he, you know, he rationalized. And then uh, they got married. They were moving to Los Angeles. And in the annulment, she said that he never grew up and he never left his mother. All that you know, static stuff you get from girls. Uh, and he, he uh, so she, uh, oh, grievous mental cruelty. I forgot that. And, you know, obviously a lawyer got to her. You know, it's one of those things, her charges. But he had wilder charges yet. He said that uh, she looked great there. She was 19 and a swinger, you know, and everything, and very exciting. But as they drove through the mountains coming to Los Angeles, she started growing older. It was his child, see? Right? A true story. I know. Don't tell anybody. Anyway, now, now back to the... Now, I just want to say a one word now. I, a couple of things uh, I forgot in front about Mrs. Luce. Uh, first of all, you know, Richard Nixon went to Moscow, and, uh, well, first of all, we have a new Secretary of State. I always like to lay that on everybody, so that we'll all be in back of him, you know, in case he makes a decision, he won't be embarrassed. We're all with him. I... So, uh, he, uh, he has to make the same decisions that the others made, unless they move the country, you know, it's kind of stuck. So, Christian Herter is the new Secretary of State, whom President Eisenhower nominated, and, uh, but first he said he would have to take a physical examination, as you recall, right? Not a written. Huh? Uh, so, <laughs> so that, and Richard Nixon had nothing to say on it. The vice president had left for Russia. He's in Moscow now, trying to get along with the Russians, who were very, you know, kind of hard to get along with, as he pointed out. And he has to get along with them, he said. You know, it's one of those things. 
And if he doesn't get along with them, he may have trouble. He'll be hard put as to what to do. Like, uh, he can't call them communists and hurt their careers. It doesn't work over there, as we all know. And uh, he used to. So, him. And who else? Uh, what else happened? Oh, mi yeah, Mrs. Lewis. I have, I have to say this, though, before about her. You know, the wild thing was the day before yesterday when she was fighting with Wayne Morris, and Morris kept bringing up the facts. See, Morris pinned her on all the things she said about Roosevelt and Truman. She said that they were traitors, and they talked us into war with Germany and Japan, which was a mistake she felt at the time. <laughs> so, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Luce, uh, when she said this, uh, you know, as Senator Dirksen, who represents uh, uh, Mrs. Luce there, sort of in the Republican Party, he said that you shouldn't bring up the past, but the idiom he used on the Senate floor was, quote, you shouldn't beat an old bag of bones, remember? So then, yeah, well, everybody started, you know, going straight up in the Senate chamber, and they're not, you know, the best audience in the world, I might add. So they started flipping, so then uh, Dirksen did the worst thing, he apologized for the remark, you know. I, like, I didn't mean her, I meant the issue, you know. When, uh, yeah, well, the, you know, the, that's the point, the apology is worse than what you did, you know. Any of you who have hit girls know that, right? <laughs> sure. They hate that. They can take anything, you know. You can belt them anything, except when you get down on your knees and apologize, then they cringe. You know, they can't make it, right? That's it. But ask them. They won't tell here, but they ask them. Anyway, so Mrs. Luce said that all of that was common knowledge about Roosevelt and Truman be being traitors. And uh, she said uh, that it was all uh, it was uh, published in the Yalta papers, which I have talked about in the past but I don't, I don't do any more as material. But I actually read them, and uh, they were published by a Republican administration, but nevertheless, they're fact, because they come from the State Department. And uh, they're usually, they're available. You know, they're, you send 10 cents to the government printing office, you can get them, and you can, uh, they're free. In other words, just stamps and all. Uh, the only thing is, uh, they're usually released during elections, the Yalta papers, that's when they publish them. And, uh, right? and uh, then they inform you, they don't bias you, but they give you, you know, a clear vision before you go to the polls. So. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, did, you, did you vote the last time you used the machines? Well, they're pretty wild. They have machines now, and you go in, and uh, it all well, depends where you vote. But they have uh, pretty groovy machines, and you can, uh, you can kind of pull them. It's great, and you pull this little rag in back here. And uh, it doesn't mean much here. A lot of people don't vote. You probably know a lot. But I worked in Washington last October, and uh, it's wild there, you know, because they can't vote. And they flip, you know, like people follow you in mobs down the street, and they'll say to you, you know, are you from California? They say, yeah. And they'll say, have you ever voted? You know, it's like a big thing to them. And uh, they say, well, uh, you know, what's it like? They say, nothing, you know. And, uh, and then they get kind of resentful, and they say, well, it's easy for you to say because you've done it, but, you know, we're... I, so, they have a mixture of fascination and caution at synthesis, so <laughs> intellectualism. So uh, they said, uh, they all ask about it, and I tell them, you know, it's nothing. You just go in a little shack, and you pull that rag in back here, and uh, in some woman's garage, right? <laughs> and, uh, I, and have a machine and a Hearst newspaper for reference, right? <laughs> So, it's pretty wild. It's, uh, it's a very... Anyway, I wasn't going to talk about that. I'm sorry I, got, I digressed. And uh, you can see, I really am a basket case this week. I'm really out of my head. And uh, largely because of what's been going on at the joint, an awful lot of things have happened since the award show. And uh, there are certain people I've lost forever, like Hedda Hopper, whom I mentioned earlier, and uh, certain people who've stayed aboard, but it's been kind of chaotic. The, uh, I did want to say that, uh, before I forget it, that... Uh, Mrs. Luce, you know, losing his appointment, this doesn't mean she's out of the race. You know, they, they'll find some country. They always do. And the president's famous for that. You know, they took a great guy out of Brazil to make room for her. He's going to Greece, a real good guy, and he knows what he's doing. And uh, the Greek situation is weirder than Brazil by far, because they, uh, they have a king over there, and we backed the king. And there was a plebiscite five years ago uh, to find out whether or not the king was popular or not. And the vote came out 93% pro-communist. So then... <laughs> So then the State Department said, well, uh, we ought to install a king anyway. And uh, then somebody who had an awful lot of conscience and guilt said, what about the 93% communists? And then a State Department spokesman who was unidentified said, yes, it's a shame that so many people could be misled. You know about this? That's a true story. I got to thinking about this. Anyway, so now, 
before I forget it, I have to tell you that there's uh, the police department. I have a couple of words. You read about them cutting their budget tonight. That's not altogether accurate. It has to do with Judge Faff. You know, we have this judge who, remember? The guy who gave out all the tickets. The worst hardhead in the world. And he always had traffic court and he'd break up families and everything. And, remember? And send you to prison for parking and everything. Well, you know, remember? So he got a, uh, he got a ticket, you remember, several weeks ago. And uh, he, uh, at the time, he said, the police are liars. That's the way he put it. And uh, which came to him as a revelation. You know? <laughs> I didn't know. So, he said, the cops are all liars. And then the, uh, that's a cultural lag. See, he hasn't had time. He's a jurist. He hasn't had time. So, uh, by the way, did you, speaking of uh, uh, jurists, did you read Mrs. Luce's remark on the Senate floor Friday? She's kind of strong, you know, in a lot of ways for a chick. She said, she said the Supreme Court is shot through with communists. Well, you know, there are only nine guys, so in order to, you know, so, <laughs> so, uh, she said they're shot through and she was alarmed about it. Actually, it works out real well because uh, you remember a few years ago, uh, they were all saying that the executive branch under Truman was shot through with communists. So under that idea of checks and balances, see, it's going to work out right. Great. <laughs> U.S. history won. So, <laughs> weird courses. Well, anyway, onward. So anyhow, Mrs. So uh, not to digress now, Judge Faff got this ticket and he demanded a trial. And I thought you'd like to know that he's going to get justice, which is, you know, a large word and I use it advisedly. And he has a trial coming up next Friday night in the Coliseum. But if you're free. <laughs> with a bearded prosecutor. That's it. You read about Castro. The American papers don't like him. We've lost our appetite for rebellion, I fear. And uh, they, they really treat him like the English are supposed to treat people. And he's kind of groovy. And a lot of you saw him on television. No, uh, the guy I work for, Jerry Wald at Fox, has the rights to his life now. And uh, they want to make it with Brando because those of you in anthropology will appreciate this because <laughs> they both have superorbital ridges. <laughs> you <know>? So... <laughs> Okay, that's a good way to get started with girls talking about anthropology is good. That's a kind of a higher level there of, you know, uh, liaison than saying I'm coming over to learn how to dance. It's more mature. Come over to talk about earlobes and things like that. So, anyway, uh, so Brando is supposed to play this thing. If you ever, you know, he's got another thing going, a sort of an annuity, this Western he's making. Anyway, uh, Castro has a lot of guts because he came here and he faced the press and he, uh, he gave him a full interview in English. Think if the president had to do that. What do you mean? I know. It's, it's, thank you. Hey, so uh, I gave up on that whole situation a long time ago. Man. Uh, anyway, uh, Castro is a pretty groovy guy, and it said in Time this week that he's diffident. They don't like him, which figures. And they said they, he came in and he stayed in Washington a day and a half and got what he wanted and left, which was a map of the area, right? <laughs> 80, <laughs> 82 people taking Panama. Isn't that and Eisenhower said yesterday at the press conference, he said they're, uh, they're Cubans. He's convinced of it, and Castro denied it. But he said even if they are, he said he's going to talk to them. Right? Hold an informal ceremony of decorations for the... I, I'd be, it'd be great. We need a kind of... A, that's what we need, one of those guys. And uh, he started in the coffee house. I think that's interesting. The... Uh, you know, up where I live, I live in Hollywood now, near the club, because I want to be close to my work. And uh, I, it doesn't matter where you live. You live in a packing crate. It doesn't matter. But I, uh, I got that kind of uh, attitude of not caring about craven tastes when I was in Berkeley. And I was going to college up there, and I couldn't... Uh, well, I couldn't get any money from the government, like the checks were late. You may have run into that from time to time. It's getting, it never come, like for two years, you don't get any money, you know. So what we used to do is go into markets in Berkeley and buy, uh, you know, anything as an excuse, a Coke or something. And then on the way through the checkout stand, we go in about six o'clock when all the housewives are there. And on the way to the checkout stand, we'd eat as much as we could on the way, you know. Cupcakes. I tell you about this? Well, anyway. So we'll talk about that later. It's a great culture up there. Anyway, a lot of that has gravitated down here. Los Angeles now has, if you can believe this, 48 coffee houses. And uh, stretching all the way to, to Manhattan Beach, you really cheat a little there. But they're all, you know, within a 45-minute drive. And uh, 
the coffee house thing has really set the bars up. You know, you don't have to go to a bar anymore. And the restaurant owners and the bar owners are really flipping as a lobby. And they have been sort of in conjunction with the police in Hollywood. We have the highway patrol up there. And uh, like the most ignorant in life, all these guys, you can't believe it. And uh, they spell Berkeley, like one of them was writing a ticket for me. And I got my driver's license in Berkeley, so he wrote B-U-R. That's the way he started it. And uh, I asked them, you know, without getting them mad there, uh, I said, you know, like, how did you get this job? So he said, well, I'm, I'm taking the exam later. He was hired, sort of as temporary. <laughs> so, uh, right, there isn't time. So, you know, soon he's a lieutenant and he hasn't taken the exam yet. And then finally, you come out of school with a degree in police administration and want to take the exam, and they say, well, we don't go by the merit system so much as tenure, right? I know, that's the way it always works. Anyway, so we have seniority. So anyway, all these cops are, they're really the hard-headedest, and they're after the coffee houses with a lot of crazy rules about health, you know. Uh, your bartenders must wear nets over their beards. When they come in. <laughs> so, so, really, well, Unbelievable. So they, uh, so I was in the unicorn. A lot of you have been by the unicorn, and I was in there, and uh, which is a kind of a composite of everything in the world, you know. And all these, there, the place is full of all kinds of weird nicks. I saw dust on the floor, and those uh, kind of uh, leftover Goodwill furniture, you know. You got a discount at the Goodwill of that furniture. Not charity, but a hand, right? So it's all there. And they have sawdust on the floor, and these sort of Jewish memorial lamps they buy, which burn. <laughs> And a bulletin board, you know, call your mother, those kind of bulletins. <laughs> and a bookstore upstairs, all those. And a bulletin board, you know, call your mother, those kind of bulletins. <laughs> and a bookstore upstairs, all those goofy paperbacks, you know. And, uh, you know, India's contribution to sociology and all that. <laughs> all, you know, awful. All that junk that you wouldn't read if it were assigned, you know. It's a type. I hate all those things. They're big, thick, you know, but they give you a feeling of power. You know, you're carrying this book, and uh, it's good. Then you come in there, and you sit down, and you watch the chicks coming in. You read the book, and they go, right? But it looks like you don't need women, because you have this, you know, right? <laughs> to say, actors have the same thing. All the actors I know uh, all uh, have osterizers now. They all drink health food and eat sponges and kelp and everything. And... Uh, and health food. I don't need anybody. I don't need a woman or anybody else. I've got this osterizer and I can grow spinach and grind it up. <laughs> and as a symbol of this new Spartan existence, I'm going to take my Diners Club book and grind it up. The osterizer. <laughs> Great idea. <laughs> All out of their heads. So, uh, oh, and the new, the new look is this. Every time somebody uh, interviews you, the actors always say, uh, well, uh, Miss Parsons, my real aim is to grow up. That's what they all say when they're in analysis and they're trying to grow up. Growing up being the next best thing to having your mother with you all the time, right? It's the next step. Well, anyway, and they're all in analysis and they all swear, you know, if they're prominent people, they all swear the analyst's secrecy has to keep your confidence. They have a kind of a stated period in the contract there of employment so that the actor's book will come out before the analysts about similar material. Well, all right. So now, back to our premise. So. The coffee houses have all these people sitting in them. If you, haven't, you know, you've been up there, you know. And they all sit around, and they have poetry and jazz and a lot of offbeat uh, thing, things going. But largely, uh, what they have are... Uh, uh, well, there's, there are no members of the Beat Generation. I can't find anybody. I mean, there are a few kooks around, but there isn't anybody who's really, you know, wild. And uh, there are a few nihilists and people like that, but they're not really nihilists because they're all preparing books on the subject, which means they're not really, right? It's good. It's just, <laughs> this is that group. And there are no women in the Beat Generation. That's the worst thing about it. You know, there's no, no evidence of sexuality at all. But there are a lot of girls who are kind of... Uh, uh, sort of made the compromise. A lot of them are kind of uh, middle class, lower middle, and they work sort of elementary school teachers, and at night they come home, from, you know, and then they uh, like take off their makeup and they put on trousers, you know, and, and a jumper and a black sweater, and they get in the Volkswagen. Women really get involved with those cars. They really dig them, don't they? They really dig Volkswagens. It's sort of... Uh, uh, when I was in Vegas, I didn't see one. You never see Volkswagens because it's conspicuous consumption, you know, all the time. Before I went to school, I didn't know what it was, but I know what it is now. So the only thing wrong with school is you get a name for it and you get a tolerance for it. Don't get the tolerance, just the name. Then go ahead, right? So set fire to them all. So they have, uh, so they, they all, anyway, there are no uh, Volkswagens up there, just cats, and everybody cops out, so you don't want to be called ostentatious. So they'd say to me, well, I saw those little cars, but they're not safe. 
See, that's it. I'm a family man. I'd like to have one, but what about the kids? Not that there isn't room, but then they tell you about some fictitious accident they ostensibly saw in which a Volkswagen hit a dog and the dog walked away, right? Not safe. All the time. So we're sitting in the coffee house there, cooling it, and uh, the cops are walking through. Uh, the cops have got all kinds of charges, you know. Uh, you know, what about, you know, I told you about the beards, and I have another one about uh, what kind of people hang out in here. You know, is it a breeding ground for the wrong kind of people? And they got all the jazz going. And uh, they're all these, uh, the girls usually come later because they work all day. None of the guys work. They're there early. And they, what's the best kind of chick to get? And uh, they will all compromise at a point. They just don't have any taste, sort of. And they always compromise with gas station attendants and everything. But it's really love. So anyway, they all come in there. And the girls are kind of rebellious. I don't mean the women don't want to change the world, but they have a kind of a thing about, uh, like, they smoke a lot. And any of you uh, who've, uh, you know, taken psych, uh, in fact, if you read the Ernest Jones books, remember, in the third book on Freud, he talks about smoking in there, and he says it isn't socially acceptable, no matter how much of it we see. And when a woman smokes, she's defying society. And all the girls in the coffee houses smoke a lot. And uh, they're, so they're kind of defiant, I figure, as soon as I see that, as soon as they light up. And they all... Uh, the girls always smoke things like, you know, like Salem's or Newport's and uh, is mentholated cigarettes with a filter, right, through a holder. They, so it's kind of, <laughs> I want to change the world, but there's no use getting a sore throat, right? That's what they're all. Well, now, thank you. So, <laughs> and they all sit around and uh, no makeup except eyeliner and, uh, they talk about FM. That's a kind of far out subject. And uh, a, lot, a lot of you listen to FM, I gather, because you know Frank well and everything. I, I want to mention this before I forget it. The FM stations were empowered by the FCC today, which is another uh, board made up of guys from Procter and Gamble and Anaconda Copper and everything, right? It's chosen men in Washington. The FCC uh, gave out a permission for the FM stations to carry Conrad. So if you're tuning to FM, you'll know if there's war. So you wouldn't know otherwise. <laughs> It's nothing but that kind of Montavani music all afternoon. You know, you never know what time it is, right? So, so if there's war on AM, you know, you go to Conrad, 640, 1240, and will be yelling about, look out for debris, and they're attacking us, and there are paratroopers in the southeast part of the city, and look out and put your lights out and pull the shades. But on FM, the announcers will still be saying things like, uh, Al, a lot of you have asked me to replay the tape of the attack earlier this week, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we're sitting, we're sitting in the coffee house, and uh, we're talking. And we're talking about the fact that the Monterey Jazz Festival this year will be held in the Hollywood Bowl. Good? <laughs> so, uh, anyway, it's a cheaper date than going to Monterey, which involves liaisons, time and everything. So, and involvement. We don't want responsibility at any cost. So then, uh, we're sitting in there, and I was talking to this girl about uh, Chinese poetry. We're talking. And a bunch of people, a couple of people were singing folk songs. They're usually on staff. They look inspired, but they're not. They work there, you know. When that girl became a folk singer, the world lost a great waitress. You know those kind of girls? So, so <laughs> with that braid. So, uh, still a woman, all in all. Trying to look like Indian chicks. That's the new thing. So, uh, and the guys are all trying to look Italian now. You know, but all the guys are now wearing Italian suits with short vents. So you see, if you take a 39 regular, get a 36 short, then you're home, right? I just got off the boat, right? Where's the employment office? It's, right it's, it's the look. Boy, men's clothes are getting to be ridiculous, but then anyway. So now, that's right, one crusade at a time. So, right, so uh, we're sitting in the anyway, we're sitting here and the cops are bugging us, just bugging everybody to death. And finally, we, the, when the sun came out, see, this is in the daytime. We started in the daytime. So uh, the sun came out, and you know what a groove it was, how clear it was, spring and everything. So the manager of the, of the place said to me, why don't we go outside and sit in the sun? So this cop came by, he was in there, and he said, because we don't want any sidewalk cafes. This is not Naples. And, uh, you know, you know, he said, I'm going to run in anybody who sits on a sidewalk. So, uh, you know, nobody said anything. There was that kind of deep-seated resentment, you know, with cops, you know, which is juvenile, but I think is, you know, expressive at the moment, sort of juvenile but satisfying, you know. All right, Hitler, 
right? What did you say? Nothing. So he cut out and he got into this Dodge 500, which they drive. They're all like delinquents, you know, these guys. They lay rubber when they leave signals. And the worst. So, thank you. So he drives away and uh, he starts. So we took a chair and we went out a chair and we went out on the sidewalk in the sun, in front of the unicorn on Sunset Boulevard. So the cop makes a U-turn and comes back. So uh, we began to worry. So then we figured, well, we'll try. So we went and got a table and some coffee and put it on the sidewalk. She so stopped the car. Stop the antenna. It's going back and forth. Right? <laughs> and the lights are going and everything. They're in the, and red and blue and yellow lights. And then, he, and then we sat down and we started to drink the coffee on the sidewalk. And now he's out of the car with this riot gun. Yeah, you know. So there was kind of a long moment there, you know, like, you know, call my mother. You know, that's about pretty. <laughs> Not my wife, because she's not close enough. I, <laughs> my mother was my best friend. But I'll always love you, but my mother. So, so anyway, it's kind of a war of nerves there. We're sitting around right on the sidewalk with a table and a chair and a coffee, and he was standing there with the riot gun, the lights, and the antenna, and the hot dodge. And then finally, we thought of a way out of it, which shows men can work together. We put a nickel in the meter, and then he left. <laughs> True. True. <laughs> now, I want to I wanted to uh, to uh, bring this to a halt by saying that I have uh, Israel is at war again, again, yeah, again, and uh, and not that uh, I'm not gonna no, nothing about bonds. Don't get nervous. <laughs> That's a oh, listen, I would like to tell you this. This is great. Sunday night in the crescendo. Was it Sunday? What is this? It's Friday. Tuesday. Tuesday night in the crescendo. Uh, I'm talking, this always happens, how audiences get nervous. Boy, you know, I really move audiences. It's not my audiences are weird, but I get to them in a kind of a strange way. Like those kids who stoned the prince when he got married in Japan had been listening to the record. You know, they went out. It's weird. And I move people in strange ways. So I don't think genetically they're like that, but I, you know, so it's like fraternity life. So this is great. So I am in uh, the club and I was referring to sex, which I never referred to. You know, you've heard the records all. I have a kind of an asexual position and my whole, I, and no interest. I just sort of, you know, overthrow the government. That's my whole, you know. So, <laughs> so I gave up on that because you can't find it, but that's all right. But thank you. I agree. Thank you. So uh, at any rate, I think it's time for a change. Well, so uh, it's a question of who they're going to run. I want to talk to you about that in a minute. It's very weird. Anyway, because uh, I'm, working, I'm working with Stevenson Friday night, next Friday night in Chicago, which should be interesting because I get, nobody knows this. Everybody said, aha, so he is a Democrat. They don't know what I'm going to say there. No one knows yet. But you know, everybody is so you know, basic, but that's uh, all right. Anyway, the, uh, the great choice between the parties, don't you think? So uh, everybody says, what if, right? I know. At, uh, so uh, nothing to do except go back in the army. That's what I was thinking about. So, did you read the thing about Admiral Rickover and uh, General LeMay fighting? They are fighting now because the uh, Air Force just got uh, uh, the custody of the Polaris missile, which is fired from submarines, which means the Navy loses its submarine fleet in effect. So, you know about that? So then Rickover said that the Air Force couldn't protect the country, and the Air Force said, we're the only ones who know how to protect the country, LeMay said. And then uh, General uh, Lemnitzer, who just took over as chief of staff in the Army, said that the Air Force is through. Manned aircraft are a thing of the past, you know. These guys are in the dark ages. So when World War III comes, and it's between the Army and the Navy, right? <laughs> With the, <laughs> the Marine Corps as ushers. That'd be a good job, right? Well... So, now back, uh, just to resolve this point. So, there's, so this guy comes up to me and he says, you never talk about sex. And he said, you ought to talk about it. That takes more courage to talk about anti-feminism than you talking about politics. That's safe. You've been doing it for years. So, uh, I decided I'd talk about sex. So, I pick up the paper. I'm looking for something about sex on the stage. And I come upon the item about Mrs. Duncan, you know, who had been accused by the DA, you know, although it's a murder trial, was accused of, uh, you know, being in an illegal establishment and something. So... Uh, she was supposed to have been, you know, like uh, in a house of easy virtue in San Francisco. <laughs> so I mentioned it on the stage, and just like that Israeli bond thing, everybody, all the guys in the audience kind of tighten up, you know. In other words, you know, like, what do they think is going to happen? There'll be a pitch for the alumni fund. You know, that kind of thinking? What is it? 
everybody's like this. And, you know, I never talk, I talk about sex because, you know, I belong to that minority that wants to document what they say. Anyway, onward. Now, uh, anybody ask you ever to document anything when you write papers? They always say that. And <laughs> that's what always happens when you read papers in class. That's what I used to do. And uh, when I was at SC, as a matter of fact, and I'd open up and I'd say, <clears throat> uh, the controversy resolved that uh, the Brannan plan will never go into effect with the Illinois Grange. And so immediately somebody would say, can you document that? Right? <laughs> and then I'd have to say, uh, yes, mining news, July 1912. You know, that makes you popular. I think it's good. Yeah. Then when you can't fight out the PhD, you can go into education, right? And get an EDD, and everybody calls you doctor. And once in a while, you know, after 20 or 30 years in the faculty, somebody says, what did you get your doctorate in? You say, well, I'm very busy. Why don't you see me during office hours? I don't know. <laughs> I have, a, I have a master's in public administration, which never got cleared up. I'll tell you about that sometime. Good committee. At, uh, I was at SC. There's a teacher that you may have had, even her name, Reining, who is, uh, I got into a fight with him about Fulton Lewis, and I left the school. You know about Fulton Lewis? Fulton Lewis is on the mutual broadcasting company, filling in for Hitler this week, right? <laughs> no. Ugh. Boy. Ah. So. So now, uh, just to uh, iron this point out, Israel is at war, and we're not going to sell any bonds. Uh, I, I do want you to know that I worked at a rally uh, for Israel uh, seven weeks ago. I really didn't do it for them. I did it for George Jessel's his birthday. And uh, part of the victory of, be of becoming a star, uh, if it comes about, is that I get to mix with George Jessel and all these stars, and Lucky, and uh, right? hollow triumph. And uh, so we went to the Beverly Hilton Hotel. You've seen a kind of bilious green joint. I went in there. And uh, everybody was juiced out of their heads. Everybody was drinking, boy, you know, which is a very unimaginative way to go if you're going to go. But everybody's drinking. So uh, I was drugged with the whole thing. And uh, that, oh, I know you read about this thing. I give you a better, Elizabeth Taylor was it. That's the one where she got real moved by the cause of Israel. And she wrote a check for $110,000, right? Thereby purchasing Israel. That's how it's going to. Of course. <laughs> Don't forget your change. All right. Now, so uh, just in summation now, uh, <laughs> what are your plans for the future? Well, so in summation, if uh, I'm elected senator at large, I want to make this the friendly school, right? So <laughs> I have a howdy day dance, right? Good. And uh, low cost housing and uh, labor youth league rallies, right? And off street parking and a medical plan. I, uh, so, which is wonderful. I, got, I thought I had mono again this week, and I called my doctor, and the reception said, uh, the service said, he's in Vegas. He went up there. The AMA has a kind of a travel plan to give them vacations. They believe in plans, group plans, for them, but not... Ah, who eat. So, thank you. Herb, you ready? Okay. So, anyway, in closing, I do want to say that Israel... <laughs> Israel, notice I'm avoiding all that material on the record, but... Uh, Israel, you probably had enough of that record in the last week, but uh, Israel is at war, and uh, she may not be at war, but President Eisenhower stepped in. Uh, Israel went to the UN. I got to hand them this. They were straight. Time magazine has a big attack on the Israeli ambassador in the current issue, and uh, in which they say that President Eisenhower is a man, you know, was one of those things, you know, he strode in clear-eyed and decisive, you know, Dwight Eisenhower, you know, that whole thing. So uh, they have an amazing perspective from under his desk, kind of, you know, so... <laughs> And it's, you know, they feel guilty because they had a lot to do with his, you know, coming about in office. So he said he strode in and he talked to the Israeli ambassador. What happened was Israel's ships are being impounded by Syria and Egypt. And every time a ship starts through, you know, uh, they like stop it and you have to, uh, uh, you know, they start searching it. So the Arabs got really panicked and started impounding. They don't even search them. And Israel has no supplies as a result. So they asked the UN to do something. You know how active the UN is about these things. And uh, nothing happened. So the Israelis, you know, dropped the hay in the field because they were good at snap judgments. And they all jumped into the jeeps and they're off to the canal, see? Uh, so, <laughs> you know, you know a lot of them. A lot of them probably exchange students there. And uh, every time a girl comes from Israel, everybody says she was a sniper. That's what they always say, right? It's kind of and other folklore. She's a sniper. So some men talking about women behind the barn. So anyhow, uh, Israel decided to go to war. And uh, so President Eisenhower s strode in, clear-eyed and decisive. And 
This is literally what the Time reports. It says, it says the, uh, the Israeli ambassador is rigid and stubborn and dogmatic there. And time is redundant and no. Anyway, time. <laughs> so that's what he is. And uh, it said the president tried to reason with him, but the guy is narrow and they have the whole conversation there. And if you can imagine the president talking like it sounds like science fiction, it says uh, President Eisenhower said, uh, he said to him, uh, Israel is guilty of territorial aggrandizement and the moral and geographical incursion on the rights of Arab nations. Like this, right? And it said, uh, and he went on to say that what you think is ostensibly patriotism in Israel is a very thin veneer for what we, we perceive to be a rabid nationalism akin to hysteria. And if it went unchecked by our Western concepts of morality, would precipitate a genocide pattern for the Western world. So, if we tell you that we're going to apply sanctions to restrain you in the Suez Canal area. He said, I, I hope you understand my position. And it said, uh, Iban, the Israeli ambassador, being very dogmatic, said, sure I do, you're an Arab. This is an Arab. Mark Saul. <laughs> thank you very much. I uh, <laughs> thank you. I've uh, I really have to split, and your attention span is kind of wild anyway. So uh, <clears throat> I want to get out of here before the mob violence, right? when someone tells you there's no intermission or smoking. And uh, I, I wonder if you could smoke if it weren't a state school, right? That's what always happens. And uh, that's what they do at Cal too. You know, they never take into uh, age into consideration. <laughs> I mean, if you're living in a co-op, you know, and uh, you come back and be 37, but they'll campus you for getting in late, right? <laughs> I used to be a real martyr before those judicial committees, you know. What are you doing climbing up that vine and through a window at 2.30? I say, some things are more important than sleep, you know. <laughs> so I got, of course, uh, I, w I do want to say this, that, uh, you know, the really, if you really want to have a revelation, uh, you know, we're working Ed's Brubeck tonight, uh, Dave and uh, it's the High Lows. I feel it's safe to tell you this now that this is the competition. <laughs> Dave and the High Lows and, and uh, Andre Previn are uh, working at the Santa Monica City College in a concert tonight. And they're really the funniest. Uh, Dave and I, you know, did the whole college tour. We did it on and off for three years. And we worked some pretty weird schools. I've talked about it on the record and all. But we worked, uh, the wildest one we worked was Smith College. The girls' schools are the wild ones, you know. And uh, it's kind of those small schools in the Midwest are a ball, too, where they have like an enrollment of about 45, you know. And, uh, you know, you always equate the aristocracy with education. In some areas, it's a penalty. To go to, that's what, and they have, you know, at the school they have a kind of an administration building and a landing strip in front of it, you know, really primitive. And we, uh, we worked Smith, and uh, there were uh, six, you know, about three quarters of the girls there were on probation. And uh, nobody goes to class, and they won't tell their parents because they won't get the money every month, you know. So they keep saying, uh, you know, and, and they talk in fantasy. I guess you have to live this way if you're going to make it. And they keep saying, you know, when I graduate, that's the way they, they talk about it, you know. <laughs> A cesarean ceremony, right? <laughs> Probation. Boy, that's a weird condition. Well, now, so I did. I have to say this in closing. Uh, the uh, some of you uh, know I talk about Princeton in the act too. Princeton was the genesis of that story I used to tell. Or a kid from Princeton wrote an article for the Police Gazette uh, called "Hitler is Alive," and he claimed that he had met him, and that uh, you know that he had met him, and he uh, judged him as a person. And he was not status ridden. They're not status ridden at Princeton. And he said he was not impressed with him just because he's Hitler. You know, it didn't get to him. Right? As much as the fact that he's from Europe, which does impress them. Yeah. You know that whole group? Oh boy. They're responsible for our clothes mores, as you know. So uh, it's a, that, that's Stevenson School, as a matter of fact. The president went to a military academy, as you know. And uh, <laughs> where did Nixon go to school? Does anybody know? Right? The Whittier State School from. No, all right. So. So, uh, it didn't take, did it? well, anyway. Now, so in closing, I do, I, I did just uh, wanted to say this, that uh, the, uh, you know, uh, Princeton is, uh, uh, Princeton, I guess the school you've really got to, uh, 
you really got to, well, Cal, you know, I always talk about Cal, although I spent most of the time there. I was at SC, too. The thing I referred to earlier about Mrs. Duncan is kind of a riot because uh, she got an appeal to go through the Supreme Court. Those of you who are you know, pre-law will be interested in this. That can drag on forever and to make a good you know, case in moot court. But uh, Mrs., uh, the thing I talked about at the club the other night was that Mrs. Duncan is from San Francisco, which is my hometown, as a lot of you know. And uh, when she was arrested up there, this is really the funniest. This is kind of academic. It sounds sexy, but there's nothing, there's nothing to panic about. I mean, it isn't that interesting. Mrs. She had this operation up there, and she had like nine girls working for her, and she was raided by the police department. And during the trial, one of the cops who raided the joint married one of the girls. They, they make fine wives and other folklore, I know. So, so he, married, he married this chick, and this is great. So uh, during the trial, she had a very hip lawyer, Jake Ehrlich, you know his reputation. And Ehrlich got together with all, these, uh, all the girls, and he said, the cops have, you know, it's illegal search and seizure. They have no warrant, so don't say anything. You don't turn state's evidence, the case has to crumble. And it did. He was born out several weeks later. And in the meantime, in order to confuse everything, her lawyer used various stratagems. For instance, when the newspapers expressed a lot of curiosity that the girls wouldn't testify against one another, he said, they have a strong group of sisterhood. And he talked about in-group camaraderie and, uh, you know, all that sociological baloney, you know, the, the first one supervisor, you know, and all that. So, and uh, a strong se sense of loyalty. So, uh, he said, you, why be, you know, why discriminate against these girls, which was his theme implicitly. He said, you find it wherever, you know, girls work together and have a sense, you know, this bond and all. And he started giving these examples. And he gave examples like airline stewardesses and nurses. And, uh, and he mentioned, he said, and sororities, you know, it's a sorority. He referred to it in that idiom. So, a letter came back from the Dean of Women at the University of California. And she said, you know, like, are you suggesting that there's any similarity between these nine girls and so on? And, oh, so <clears throat> Mr. Ehrlich left us some words of wisdom, which even apply today. He said, I wouldn't for a moment suggest that there's any similarity between a sorority house and these nine girls. In fact, I'd like to point up, uh, you know, the basic difference, and that is that these nine girls have a purpose. That's our message tonight. Let's see a show. Let's talk.